All right, good morning, church family. My name is Jason Smith. I have the awesome privilege of being the pastor here at First Baptist and leading us this morning. It's been an incredible morning already, and now we get to turn to God's Word. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3 as we continue our walk through uh, our fall sermon series. We've been walking through the book of 1 Timothy and it has not been without its controversies. It is a, uh, a book that has lots of issues to deal with, all right? So you uh, turn there, hold your spot in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up where we were uh, leaving off last time. Last time we looked at the position of overseer and kind of church uh, uh, structure and the office of overseer. And this morning we're going to look at the office of of deacon. Uh, with that, <clears throat> I want to turn your mind to Acts chapter 6. You hold your spot there in 1 Timothy. But in Acts chapter 6 is a really good reminder to us that there was plenty of complexity in the early church in Jerusalem. Now that's a diplomatic way of saying that they had their problems too, okay? So Anyone with leadership experience knows that with growth comes logistical headaches. Well, as the story goes, that the early church is, is growing, they've exploded in growth, and they're trying to care for the most vulnerable among them, the widows, okay? And uh, by daily distributing food uh, to the widows of the church, now pause and think about how amazing this is and what a task that the early church is taking on. It's something that the leadership of Israel had largely ignored. But due to the generosity of God's people, okay, who are giving to the church, they are able to faithfully meet the needs, okay, tangible needs of those who would otherwise have to beg and or starve. But in this giving and distribution of food, a complaint arose of favoritism. And the dividing lines went along cultural lines. Now, in your mind, think almost racist lines. Those who were Jew, there was a group of Jews that were very conservative, and they had isolated themselves from the Romans, and they only spoke Hebrew. But there was another group of Jews who dressed with the culture, they spoke Greek, and they had assimilated kind of into the Roman culture. Now, whether it's true or not, the claim was of favoritism along these lines, okay, that the, the, uh, the Jews who only spoke Hebrew were being favored. Now, this is a major claim because of what it says about the gospel. So the issue must be stamped out, okay, because there are no class divisions within Jesus' church. But the apostles and elders of the church were far too busy to deal with the logistics of daily food distribution. So here's what they do. They tell the congregation, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we, whom we may put in charge of this task, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, I want you to notice the apostles didn't appoint themselves, right? Peter's there. He could have said, look, these seven guys, they're in charge. No, the congregation elected their own leaders and the office of deacon was born. Now, they're coordinating, they're in the details of the serving ministry of the church. And notice whom they select, men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So also with our text today, we will see that 30 years later when Paul writes 1 Timothy, Paul instructing Timothy in the church at Ephesus about the office of deacon, you and I are going to notice lots of similar qualities that are expected. So with that, let's read 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued 
or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husband of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons attain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, as we as your people think well about the church. Uh, We've thought about the ordinances and how they incredibly picture the gospel. Um, And now, Father, we're we're thinking about the offices uh, that you have instructed through your word to be set up within the New Testament church and how these offices are supposed to function. Father, help us to think well. Um, God, because we want to glorify you as your people. We want to shine your light to a culture that needs to see the hope of the gospel. And we need to have a a strong family that is not dysfunctional, like the one that we read about here, but one that uh, that is healthy and is doing all the things that you require and desire us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so just a reminder of where we've been in our letter of 1 Timothy, that false teachers had risen up within the church there at Ephesus and causing major divisions and conflicts. And so if the church is going to accomplish its mission that's been set out, right, to be to shine the light of the gospel to the community and to the far reaches of the earth, okay, then the church itself must not be a dysfunctional family. And that is why Paul is focusing on godly church leadership, okay? For leadership is the soil in which the body of the church grows. And last week we looked at the office of overseer, or what we typically call pastor. And this week we're looking at that second office prescribed in the New Testament, the office of deacon. Now the word deacon, the Greek word is diakonos, which means servant or one who waits tables. It was a lowly title in the Roman world. But isn't it interesting that the early church chose it to designate a highly esteemed position within the congregation? Now why do you think that is? Because Jesus said, The greatest in the kingdom are servants. Verse 8 begins, deacons likewise. Okay? That is in the same manner as the overseers. Verse 1 through 7. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity. Now we saw how last week the emphasis as you comb through there was character matters. Over talent Over charisma, character matters, and so too with deacons. In both offices of the church, the church leadership must represent Christ's people with the utmost character, beyond reproach, marked with dignity, recognized by all as having character, worthy of being stamped a leader within Jesus' church. Now, as you comb through the list, we find uh, that this list is very similar to the one that we covered with the overseers. Beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, a good manager of his children and his household. And just like an overseer must not be a new convert, so with deacons, verse 10 says, they must be tested, meaning time given to examination before being thrust into visible leadership position. The exception that's given between the two lists is that deacons are not required to teach. That is because they are not given the same congregational teaching authority. Because the position is one of servant leadership, 
not of governance. All right, so I've been wrestling with this all week, and that is where to tackle the controversial piece. All right, so do you guys want, want that now? All right, so here we go. If you look at verses 8 and 11, I want you to look at the screen here, okay? Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, okay? And then not double-tongued. Women, likewise, must be dignified in verse 11. Now, in the Greek, there are three words that are here. Deacons, likewise, and then dignified is given in the masculine form, okay? And then there is no feminine form for deacon, or, all right, for diakonos. There's just women, likewise, and then dignified is given in the feminine form. All right, so here's the discussion. In Greek, the word gune means women or woman or wife. And it's only the context that tells you the difference. Do you translate this women or do you translate it wives? So here we have an interpretation decision. Is the text addressing women who serve as deacons, otherwise in English what we would call a deaconess, or is the text addressing wives of deacons? Now, like most issues that have this level of implication within church, there is debate. And there are Jesus-loving people on both sides of the debate. Okay? But... The textual evidence actually seems to considerably favor the understanding of women who serve as deaconesses. So those who try to make this wives of deacons fall into three major errors. Uh, The first is the structure that's laid out here. Remember, deacons likewise dignified in the masculine form and then Women, likewise, dignified in feminine form. There, there is no feminine form for uh, diakonos, okay? So Paul's structure here seems to indicate with that symmetry of women who serve as deaconesses. Secondly, there's an absence of a pre, pre, sorry, possessive pronoun, all right? And that's very difficult to ignore. The verse begins women not their women, okay? And this would be unusual for Paul, who takes great care to identify the subject in other places. And thirdly, why would Paul address wives of deacons without addressing the wives of the overseers in the list just above it? So the list of the qualifications for the two offices is noticeably very similar begs for one to compare the two. So why would wives of the lower office be addressed and not wives of the overseer? Elsewhere, in Romans 16.1, Phoebe seems to be given the title of deaconess, the church of uh, Crencrea. Additionally, history actually has much evidence to indicate that the early church allowed women to hold this servant office within the church. Whereas history does not support women serving as overseers, it does them serving in the deacon role. Now, for those of you that have been convinced by my reasoning, whether you know it or not, you have also agreed that women cannot serve in the overseer role. For if Paul specifically says that women can serve in this role and specifically calls them out here, then it is very noticeably absent that he does not say that women can serve in the overseer role. All right, well now you've done it. What a four-week run we've had here. We've had men and women's behavior in the church. We have women cannot serve as overseers according to created order. And now we have women can hold the office of deaconess. There is one thing we can conclude. 
That is that I am not running for political office anytime soon. (laughs) All right, controversy aside, I'll leave the rest of you to discuss at the lunch table. I'm sure it'll be lively. All right, let's spend a few of our moments left focusing on the function of the deacon office, okay? Why was the office of deacon created? Every pastor I know struggles with the overwhelming urge to get sucked into the nuts and bolts of ministry operation, okay? Decisions, 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 and meetings, meetings, meetings. But the reality is, is there's too much ministry. There's too much that the church is involved in. There are too many members that have personal needs, and there are only so many hours, And church, let me ask you this question. In a busy week that's full of lots of activity, what do you think the first thing to get cut as a minister is? What's the time that you spend preparing Sunday morning sermon? It's the time that we can spend as a pastoral staff praying for the church. It's the time that I can even spend picking up a phone and praying with members who are in the middle of a crisis. That's why the Acts 6 passage is so important, because the leaders in Jerusalem said, it is not good for us, it is not good for us, okay, to neglect God's word in prayer. Therefore, the church should appoint servant leaders, deacons, who are full of the Holy Spirit and are dignified and are godly, to be extension arms of the pastors, so that they can free up the pastors for their primary responsibility of prayer and spirit-filled leadership and high-quality biblical teaching. So I want to brag on our deacons a bit. So one Sunday uh, here at the church, there was a, a medical issue. One of our members had a health episode um, and had to be rushed to the hospital. Now, I didn't find out about this until hours later, and after finishing up things here, about two or, it was like two or three in the afternoon that I, I can make it to, uh, to the emergency room to, to check on our member. And to my surprise, sitting there is one of our deacons waiting in the emergency room with the member and his wife. She doesn't drive, and he waited here on campus for her, made sure that she got lunch, drove her to the hospital, helped communicate with the doctor and and sort through all of that, and was there waiting, listening for marching orders to determine whether he was going to drive one or both of them home. I just swooped in and found out the details and prayed and went home. But this deacon, with no instructions... Okay, for no attention, right, did this without anyone even knowing. The reality is, church family, I could give you hundreds of stories just like that, of stuff that's happening behind the scenes because we have amazing deacons. The Bible gives the office of deacon a great deal of flexibility on how a church can organize and exactly what deacons should be doing. It simply says there are to be servant leaders who are godly for the purpose of freeing up the pastors by leading, by getting into the nitty-gritty details and interacting very closely with the congregation. This is why a couple years ago here at First Baptist, we did an intensive restructuring of our church body and the deacons, okay? So the story goes back when COVID hit, just like I planned, okay? I was here six weeks and then wham, COVID hits. Now put yourself in my shoes because I was a brand new pastor and suddenly in-person services are completely shut down. It was right then that we realized we didn't know who our members were. 
See, like many churches, we had sloppy, inflated membership roles. And here we were in a crisis with almost no connection point with our people. So over the course of the year following that, we worked very hard to get accurate roles and to reorganize our church membership into deacon flocks so that each member has a deacon, okay, who knows who they are and prays for them and functions as an extension arm of the pastoral staff. So last week I received a phone call from one of our deacons who was on the hunt for resources. He had a church family that was under his flock care uh, that had extenuating circumstances and needed legal counsel. So as he unfolded the story, the beautiful part for me was how well he knew our people. He knew the details of everything that was going on. Okay? He knew her daughter lived in Houston and what was going on with her situation and the urgency that he was communicating. All right? We need this. right? Can the ch- what can the church do to help? See, our deacon body is the lifeblood here at FBC. 67 servant leaders who check on their membership, who serve every week in a rotation around campus on Sunday mornings. Two weeks ago, they did a tree trimming project uh, down on the grass because we're in need of additional parking. And then they've been parking uh, down there. They trimmed the trees, and now they park down there on the grass. In a few weeks, we will have an Act 6 Widows and Widowers uh, banquet. And there are a thousand other invisible ways that our deacons here at this church serve the church family. Verse 13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in uh, in Christ Jesus. You see, I find it so fitting that the early church picked a lowly, somewhat derogatory word, diakonos, servant, one who waits tables, to be the office of the New Testament church. It makes me think of the night that, uh, the night of the Last Supper where Jesus got up from the table and begins to wash his disciples' feet. You say, but he was their rabbi. I know. But he was was the son of God. I know. But this was the night of his arrest and impending death. I know. Matthew 20, verse 26 Jesus says, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Will you pray with me? King Jesus It is enough for us to walk in your footsteps. It is enough for us to become like you, to become servants, to want to follow after you. Father, we pause to praise you for the faithful deacons who serve here at First Baptist Bernie. We know that they juggle a career in a busy home life, that they are being pulled a hundred different ways, and yet they serve faithfully because they love your church. Because they love your church and they free up the pastoral staff to be able to focus on the things that we are able to focus on. And we praise you for them. As a church body, we pray for them right now. God, we pray for their marriages, 
pray that you would strengthen them. We pray for their homes, knowing that like every one of us, there's complexity with the kids and kids don't come with instructions. And there are circumstances at work that pull them every which way. Father, continue to strengthen them so that they can serve our church body well. And Father, as we've been walking through 1 Timothy, we see this incredible call that you give to the church to shine the light of Jesus Christ into the culture, into the darkness. Father, we understand the importance of a leadership in order to be able to accomplish our mission. And so again, we pray for this church, for our church. We pray for the overseers. We pray for the deacons. Father, help us to be a healthy family so that when those who are in the culture are looking for truth, that they would see you in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, church family, the praise team's gonna come and lead us in one final song. This has been a very full service, right? From our multi-generational picture of the children leading in worship, to baptism, to Lord's Supper, to God's word. If the Spirit of God has spoken to you through any of this, then you must, in obedience to him, respond. I can never tell you what that looks like, okay? But respond in faith and in obedience. You may be here and you may be like Stephanie, who one month ago realized that she needed to place her faith in Jesus Christ as her personal savior. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you about anything, about anything. But church family, I want you to stand. I want you to sing in faith and in obedience to him.